welcome everyone on this spring-like evening in New York. Tonight is amazingly our 29th Zoom panel discussion. This evening, with the magical technology of Zoom programming, we are again able to connect an international audience and bring together artists and experts from distant locations to join together for about 90 minutes to both educate and hopefully inspire us. Tonight's topic, Shigaraki, its art and adherence, and their impact on the world of clay art will be approached from several perspectives. Uh, that of scholar, curator, and artist, both Japanese and American. The creation of this panel and its timing was inspired by the current exceptional exhibition at the University of Mich Michigan's Museum of Art called Clay as Soft Power, Shigaraki Ware in Postwar America and Japan, conceived of and assembled by its insightful and persevering Asian art curator, Natsu Oyobi, who is joining us tonight from Ann Arbor. Fortunately, she does have power despite the storm they just had yesterday. We will also be joined by artist Otani Shiro, who will be speaking to us live from Japan and his interpreter will be longtime friend and supporter, the clearly reigning expert on Asian ceramics, our friend Louise Court, who is also going to be a participant tonight. Now based in North Carolina, I am delighted to welcome the talented Japanese art couple Hitomi and Takoro Shibata. And lastly, we are very fortunate to have the charismatic superstar artist Peter Callis joining us from Florida to offer his insights. Tonight, our audience is as global as our panelists and arguably more global. We have well over 500 registrants from over 20 countries including for the, for the very first time, Hungary, Chile, Uruguay, the United Arab Emirates, Argentina, and US viewers from more than 30 states. Included in this diverse audience are a broad range of museum professionals, a really significant number of potters from around the world. Welcome to everyone who has gathered to join us near and far, who bring with them their unique perspectives to this event. Should you have comments and questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and time allowing, we will address those questions following the main discussion that should last just over an hour. So I wanna get this show on the road, but before doing so, because we have so much content to cover, I would like to uh, read a quote from Louise Court from her seminal 1979 publication, Shigaraki, Potter's Valley. She wrote, the landscapes on Shigaraki jars have seasons also. Some jars are as bright and vivacious as a spring morning with green glaze cascading over a warm orange surface. Others are moody and withdrawn, barely touched with color streaks of lavender and blue against dry gray glaze. The 15th century tea men who first brought these jars into their tea rooms knew how to read the landscape, just as they could read shadings of ink on paper and see mountains and streams. In their mind's eye, they saw the valley that had made the jars. So I would like now to ask my first question, which will be to Natsu Oyobi, but I would like, I probably should first give her credentials, which are uh, substantial. She's a PhD and curator at the University of Michigan Museum of Art, specializing in modern and contemporary Japanese art. She has curated numerous art exhibitions, including Wrapped in Silk and Gold, a family legacy of 20th century Japanese kimono in 2010, Mari Katayama from 2019, and the current show, Clay as Soft Power, Shigaraki Ware in post-war America and Japan that continues till I think May of this year. She is also involved in cross-cultural projects from a variety of historical periods, including Isama Noguchi and Chipai Shu, Beijing 1930. And Dr. Oyobe has also served as a consulting curator for the uh, DIA for the Detroit Institute of Arts, New Japanese Galleries from uh, 2016 and 17 and for the Denver Art Museum in 2020. 
She is contributor and co-editor of Great Waves and Mountains, Perspectives and Discoveries in Collecting the Arts in Japan, published by the University of Florida just last year. So Natsan, I, my first question is to you. Uh, your current exhibition on view at Michigan highlights the specific qualities of Shigaraki ware that played an unexpected ambassadorial role between Japan and the US during the critical post-war period. Can you tell us more about the story that you have aptly named, quote, clay is soft power, unquote. What connotations does Shigaraki ware evoke to those in Japan? And the way Shigaraki ware is understood and used to non-Japanese encountering these forms and glazes for the very first time. Thank you. Thank you, John and Bonnie, and also uh, everyone at the John Mervis Gallery uh, to have this wonderful webinar panel uh, to coincide with the exhibition, Clear Soft Power, She Argue in Post-War America and Japan. Um, the pottery industry in Shigaraki developed from producing storage and cooking vessels for nearby farming community in the 13th century to becoming a large production uh, site for various kinds of ceramic styles and functions for more mass production, uh, mass consumption in the Edo period. I am showing a variety of glazed ceramic statues of tanuki or raccoon dogs on this side, and they were all made in shigaraki and thus considered shigaraki ware. One particular type of shigaraki ware is called yakishime or unglazed wood-fired wares. The yakishime shigaraki ware was admired by tea practitioners in Japan as part of the rise of wabi tea in the 16th century. And this is the type collected and displayed in the United States during the 1960s through the 80s. It was an important art form to shift the public opinion of Japan from a war enemy to an ally in the war against communist threats. The simple rustic appearance and its historic use as storage vessels for neighboring farming communities, yakishime shigaraki will fit well in the post-war discourse on Japanese art and culture, which celebrated rustic folk and folk type wares in preference to the sophisticated industrial porcelain wares popular before World War II. This reinforced the notion of Japan and its people as uh, austere and modest. In the exhibition, we are showing storage jars which enter the collection of Cleveland Museum of Art, University of Michigan Museum of Art, and Detroit Institute of Arts in the 1970s and 80s. Um, James Marshall Plummer, University of Michigan professor who organized the exhibition, Japanese Pottery Old and New at the Detroit Institute of Arts in 1950, selected works of Minge and Yakishime ceramics as well as truly, truly reflecting the characters of Japanese people. These types of wares were a stark contrast from highly polished ornamental porcelain wares many Americans were familiar with. Uh, this example here is from the uh, Mets collection. Here it is important to note that shigaraki ware was introduced along with other wares, such as bizen, tokoname, echizen, tamba, of rokoyo of the or the six ancient kilns, and contemporary ceramics made by Kitaoji no Sanjin, minge potter Hamada Shoji, and other uh, type of folk wares. On the left is a display of contemporary folk wares at the exhibition Japanese Pottery Old and New. On the right is a shigaraki ware vase, um, or more li likely um, like a jar, um, but uh, it was made by Rosanjin. This jar was one of the works that appeared in Rosanjin's solo exhibition at MoMA in 1954. The reason why shigaraki ware ended up with many American museums and private collections is because of the town's geographical proximity to Kyoto, where many important dealers resided. The jars were sourced from the storage areas of private homes in Shigaraki and the surrounding area, then purchased and sent overseas. How much Shigaraki ware jars were popular collecting items for Americans uh, can be um, guessed from a conversation Japanese photographer Domon Ken had with the Kyoto dealer Kondo Kingo. Kondo met an American collector who was seriously looking for Shigaraki jars and that made Kondo start collecting them. 
in my research for the exhibition, I found that more than 75 museums in the US own some Rokoyo wear jars, and Shiaraki wear jars are the largest number. They were displayed in exhibitions and permanent galleries and became a regular presence for telling the history of Japanese art. Thank you. Thank you, Natsan. That was uh, illuminating and le leads me to wonder with the proximity of Shigaraki to Kyoto and Tamba's proximity to Kyoto, I would think it's, it has more to do with the beauty of Shigaraki versus the austerity of Tamba, but we, that's for another day. <laughs> Uh, my next question is to uh, the amazing Louise Court, uh, who is the Curator Emerita of Ceramics at the National Museum of Asian Art, formerly the Freer Sackler uh, in Washington, DC. Her research interest is, uh, interests have been and remain historical and contemporary ceramics in Japan, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. As I said before, in 1979, she published her first book based on her early academic research Shigaraki Potter's Valley, which was reprinted again after 1979 in 2000. Her other really important publications that are well worn on my shelf are Isama Noguchi and Modern Japanese Ceramics, A Close Embrace of the Earth with uh, Bert Tamaki in 2003, Chigusa and the Art of Tea with Andy Watsky in 2014, and most recently, and those of you who don't own this book already should get online now and get it, which is Listening to Clay, Conversations with Contemporary Japanese Ceramic Artists uh, done together with Halsey and Alice North and published uh, just this past year. In 2012, she received the Secretary's Distinguished Scholar Award from the Smithsonian and the Koyama Fujio Memorial Prize for her research on historical and contemporary Japanese ceramics. So Louise, you've spent so many years, uh, I, I would dare I say a lifetime, studying Shigaraki Yaki. And it was the subject of your very first and influential book. When considered alongside other ancient kiln traditions, what do you feel was the unique appeal of Shigaraki? And as an eyewitness to the transformative past few decades, what did you observe in Shigaraki that enriched your understanding of these artists and of the field in general? Louise? Okay, thank you, Joan, and thank you to all of your wonderful team. Uh, I came upon Shigaraki where in a museum setting. I was an art historian and I noticed these masterpieces of medieval storage jars and tea ceramics in museum settings. But my understanding of Shigaraki changed profoundly when I visited Shigaraki the place and Shigaraki the people for the first time. Uh, I first visited in March 1968, and I laugh now when I remember how unprepared I was. Somehow, I almost imagined that I would see medieval storage jars lined up along the streets, but that was not the case. I did spot this one cheerful green striped jar, but it was standing in an otherwise mud brown, cold, wintry landscape. But things improved greatly when I met my mentor, Hirano Toshizo, the man on the left, um, standing in a Shigaraki clay mine together with Sasayama Tadayasu, whose work is also in Natsu's exhibition. Um, Hirano Sensei spent his adult life in Shigaraki. He was the head of the research institute for training young potters in the town, in the community. And he retired and became a potter himself. And I sometimes approached his house and saw smoke billowing out from his wood-fired kiln as on this particular day. In Hirano Sensei's free time, he also spent a lot of time walking around the overgrown hillsides in the Shigaraki Valley looking for shards that were indications of forgotten kiln sites and that were tracings of the history of ceramic production in the valley. He also knew that the family-run workshops in the Shigaraki Valley had made many different ceramic products over 
the centuries of their operation. For example, a hundred years earlier in the late 19th century, Shigaraki made wonderful teapots. And seeing works like this opened my eyes to the concept of Shigaraki as the totality of its 800 year history. Hirano Sensei also introduced me to many of the marvelous people who continued the patterns of ceramic production in the valley, especially um, to the people who made the large jars, the descendants of the medieval storage jars to which the Shigaraki clay is so well suited. My research continued from 1968 to 1979, and also included visits to the last operating wood-fired multi-chamber climbing kilns in the valley, such as this one. You see the kiln under its giant bat-like black roof on the left, and the workshop up the hill on the right. And, and the kiln that these roof, the roofs sheltered was this giant structure as big as a bungalow. And uh, yet it was operated by these two people in the case of the kiln I just showed you, this wonderful man and his sister-in-law who was the wife of the kiln owner, handled much of the production with a small team of assistants and let me come and watch. Each of the chambers of the kiln, which numbered in this case, I think 12 or 13, was the size again of a, of a bedroom. And each chamber had to be filled with pots to be fired and then unloaded after the firing roughly once a month all year long. This team of, of workers was truly amazing. I was especially lucky one time to be able to sit all night long beside the kiln as it was being fired and to listen to the sound of the wood and enjoy the scent of the wood as it was burning in the kiln. The kiln firing had not been so different a, a century earlier, except that this potter was accompanied by his son who was waving a fan to keep the flames out of his father's face as the father bravely put in another stick of wood. Or five centuries earlier, the firing took place at kilns like this. And this is a rather strange image because this is an archeologically excavated kiln. And you see actually three kilns on the hillside um, that were operated one after another. Um, and these kilns uh, were the ones that made the storage jars that everyone fell in love with. Um, the storage jars like this with their unglazed um, clay or their clay with accumulations of ash and occasional ash melting into glaze and dripping down. But by around 1600, Shigaraki potters following trends throughout the country learned to make glaze and to apply it to their jars. And they made tea leaf storage jars like this, which they supplied to the central government of Japan for use in annual uh, collecting of newly harvested tea to give as gifts. By around the 19th century, the glazes became even brighter. And here's another one of those wonderful green stripe jars. Big jars like this, eye-catching jars, stood in front of tea shops in cities and towns, advertising the wares that were contained within them. And in the first half of the 20th century, this colorful glazing was transferred to another hallmark product of Shigaraki, a product that really made it rich, in fact. Ceramic hibachi, which was used throughout the country for heating the rooms of Japanese homes until the post-war years when uh, electrical and kerosene heating finally replaced them. And now they can be found in use as flower pots. But the enduring trademark of Shigaraki throughout the 20th century and into the 21st 
has been the raccoon dog that we've already seen. This is a, the tanuki, the trickster from Japanese folklore, who can always get his way. And in this case, he wants to get a free refill of his sake bottle. And so statues of Shigaraki Tanuki stand outside the entrances to bars and restaurants around the country, welcoming people to come in and have a drink. Meanwhile, though, alongside these traditional long-lasting products, Hirano Sensei was working hard to help Shigaraki potters and pottery making factories in particular move into the modern age. And he invited potters from Kyoto, including Kumakura Junkichi, who designed many of the garden furniture pieces that you see here displayed at the research center. Uh, tourism beginning in the 1970s was also a very important new influence in Shigaraki. People came for the first time and they wanted to have a cup of coffee and they wanted to see the work that people were making in the valley, not in their own workshops, which were still hard to find, but in galleries. And the white building at the end of the newly paved walkway along the river is the gallery that held and still holds the coffee shop and gallery called Poem perhaps the pioneering display space welcoming visitors to the Shigaraki Valley. So the landscape of Shigaraki for me at this point is packed with memories. It, already my research in the 1970s belongs to the past. And I think back when I put together slides like this of the people who populated the Shigaraki Valley over centuries, and made pots there, and all the clouds of smoke that rose from wood firing kilns throughout those centuries. I remember the people I knew, and I think also to the people who are living in Shigaraki now and who will do so in the future. And I look forward with pleasure and curiosity to see what they will do with Shigaraki clay. Thank you, Joan. Oh. Thank you, Louise. That was really beautiful as well as poignant. And uh, I have lots of questions that I'm going to have to ask you after because I'm sure it's going to bore everyone else. But okay, um, lots of new insights for me, I hope for everyone else. So uh, now I will turn to actually a person from Shigaraki and one of the major artists in Shigaraki. And uh, Louise, who's an old friend of Otani Shiro, uh, will help to make his questions understandable to the majority of our audience who do not speak Japanese. <laughs> so Otani Sensei was designated. Yeah, yes. matte. Otani Sensei was designated the intangible cultural asset of Shigaraki ceramics in 1990. He has been the leader in wood-fired ceramics in that region for decades. Constantly searching for his own voice in a centuries old tradition, he has taught and studied extensively in the United States. After studying under masters such as uh, National Living Treasure Shimizu Uichi and mastering ancient forms, he furthered his studies with artist residencies in the US at programs in Tennessee, Georgia, New York, California, and Maine. After a lifetime of study and experimentation, he has focused on using the difficult and unpredictable nature of Shigaraki style, extended to extended firing, to create his intentionally distorted and quote unquote broken vessels, which harken back to water jars, Mizuzashi of the 17th century. His work is in the collections of museums throughout the world. So Otani Sensei, you have had several artist residents in the US. So can you please tell us about your experiences in this country? What changes have you witnessed as an artist? Or what did you discover through your interactions with Americans, either students, artists, or collectors who were interested in your work? Please tell us. Dozo. Hey, I saw the snap. Mm, just 
うん私はね、えー、1970年頃私の家にいろんな人が来て外国人の人が来ましたその時にうんいろんな外国人から教えられたこともあるし、えー、また外国人の、えー、面倒を見ながら、えー、いろんな勉強をしたりお互いに勉強していました。In the mid 1970s, a friend who was teaching at Kyoto City University of Arts asked me to help look after an American potter who was studying there. The American spent time with my family while helping me with tasks, <clears throat> loading and firing my kiln. Moreover, he often brought his foreign friends with him. And thanks to this experience, I lost my lack of confidence about associating with foreigners. えー、積極78年に、えー、WCC、バールクラブカウンセリングが京都でありまして、その時あの京都の<咳>陶芸部会の人が、信楽に一日ツアーで来ることになり、えー、私たち信楽の人はいろ,いろいろとあのその人たちのホストをやしました。In 1978, the World Crafts Council held its international conference in Kyoto. The ceramics division of the Japanese planning committee arranged for a visit to Shigaraki and assigned various responsibilities to the hosting Shigaraki potters. すごく喉が渇いたっていう感じに見えたので、えー、近くの自動販売機へ連れてきましたそしてまあ彼女はコカ・コーラのあ飲んですごくあのあよかったっていう顔をしましたし時間があったので私の家へあの連れて行って私の作品を見せたり顔を見せたりして、えー、過ごしましたその時My job was to help people find their way around Shigaraki. As I was waiting at the top of a slope, an older woman looking tired made her way up the hill toward me. She seemed thirsty, so I guided her to a nearby vending machine where she bought a Coke. And drank it down with evident pleasure. <clears throat> Since there was still lots of free time in the event schedule, I offered to show her my work and I took her in my car to my home and workshop. We could scarcely communicate with one another, but through an interpreter, she told me to get in touch if I ever came to America. And she gave me her name card. <laughs> うちで勉強してたロックバーナーっていうのがあのアメリカへ帰りまして、で彼からあの頼りがあって、なんかアメリカ人と日本人のアーティストが1年間、交換留学生の制度が悪いことを、そういう情報を聞,聞きましたそれし。そして、私はそれにトライして選考、最終選考に残りました。The foreign student who spent time in my home was Rob Barner. When Rob returned home, he told me about a program for a one year exchange of Japanese and American artists. <coughs> I applied and became one of the finalists. So, I was able to get a lot of money. I was able to get a lot of money. I was able to get a lot of money. I was able to get a lot of money. I was able to get a lot of money. I was able to get a lot of money. I was able to get a lot of money. But that posed a big problem. The Japanese finalists for the fellowship were required to speak English <coughs> and to have an invitation to work at a university or in the studio of, of a famous artist. I met neither requirement. えー、前に WCC で出会ったあのテネシーのおばさんというか女性の名刺を見て、えー、彼女に連絡をして
、えー、どうしてもアメリカ行きたいっていうあの相談した。彼女はテネシー大学、テネシー州のトラスト協会の,あの役員さんだったらしくて、彼女はすぐにテネシー大学の学長のところに行って、大谷を、うん、テネシー大学の、えー、へ入れるようにっていうことを申しました。えー、そしたらあの彼女は日本の、うん、文化庁へあの彼女というかあのテレス大学の学長が日本の文化庁へ連絡して、えー、私はしましてあのあのそのフェローになったんですけれども私にとって、まあ、アメリカのコカ・コーラが縁でアメリカに行けたことは非常に楽だったと思います。うん But I suddenly remembered the woman I had met through the World Crafts Council Conference, and I got in touch with her. At that time, she was a member of the Tennessee State Craft Association. So she immediately contacted the president of the University of Tennessee and asked to have a place made for me. And she also informed the Japanese、uh, organizers of the, of the exchange program. Thanks to this, I successfully passed through the fierce competition and received the fellowship. As far as I'm concerned, Coca Cola was my savior. I think that in America, 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 I think that in そういうことはあのアメリカの人とかいろいろ学校行くことは非常に私にとっていい勉強になっていいチャンスを持ちました。My association with various Americans in Shigaraki、um, and then in Tennessee was deeply meaningful to me, fulfilling my long standing wish to experience living <coughs> in a foreign country. 私は1980年に天使大学で。学んでいたんですけれども、まあ、その大学の方から大学院生の指導をしてくれということを頼まれまして、まあ、客員教授という肩書きをもらって、えー、生徒に教えたんですけれども、えー、どうしても日本の陶芸を教える場合にやっぱり日本の巻き窯っていうのもが必要になってきまして、まあ、いろいろあの検討して、えー、巻き窯穴窯を作ることにしました。I spent the year 1980 at the University of Tennessee, where I was given the title of visiting professor and was asked to advise graduate students and provide training about many aspects of Japanese ceramics. I realized that it was impossible to teach these topics without a wood fired kiln, which was essential. And <laughs> so I proceeded to build a wood fired single chamber kiln. In Tennessee. まあ、その時作った釜が今でも聞いていてみんなが使っていってくれることを非常に嬉しく思っています。日本の東京の,あの本館はやっぱ茶道なんですね。その茶道は結構日本の焼き物に関わっていて。えー私の,あのアメリカでのワークショップでも茶碗を作ったり茶糖を作ったりするのを少し取り入れて、えー、そして出来上がったもので、まあ、茶室を作り簡単な茶室を作りそこでお茶を味わってもらってその,あの茶道のなんか心っていうか雰囲気を味わ,あの味わってもらっています。I believe the vessels used for tea at, are at the heart of Japanese ceramics. So, in my recent workshops that I teach in the United States and elsewhere, I include guidance on making tea bowls. At the workshop's conclusion, I construct <coughs> a simple tea room, invite a specialist tea teacher with, to meet with the workshop participants, and prepare tea for them in their finished tea bowls. まあ、1985年頃っていうのは、はいえー、巻き窯をやる人はアメリカでも非常に少なかったんですけれども、まあ、今ではすごくあのアメリカでも世界でもあの巻き窯があの流行ってまして
そのすごく広がったことにもびっくりしています。As of 1980, there were very few potters using wood fired kilns in the United States. But today I am amazed by the booming interest in wood firing in America and throughout the world. As for myself, I continue to look to my wood fired kiln for small clues about how to advance my work. Thank you both. That was really illuminating, and I, I wonder actually how many of those lucky young ceramic students, potters, <laughs> actually have、uh, become professional potters and what impact. I'm sure your impact was lasting.、Uh, amazing and great photos. Thank you to Willie for those terrific photos, and Louise for your artful interpretation. My pleasure.、Uh, next, I would like to introduce Hitomi and Takuro Shibata. Uh, both of them reside in,、uh, obviously, they're a couple in Seagrove, North Carolina, and create ceramic works using wild natural clays and wood firing techniques. They regularly participate in exhibitions, conferences, workshops, and symposiums to share their clay stories and connect with other ceramic artists, interesting cultures, and unique materials. Their first book, Wild Clay, was published by Bloomsbury in October of last year. Takuro Shibata graduated from Doshisha University in Kyoto with a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Applied Chemistry. His passion for ceramics led him to become an apprentice in Shigaraki. Takuro san is currently the director of Starworks Ceramics, where he researches North Carolina's wild clays and has gained national recognition as a ceramic artist and wild clay specialist. He became a member of the, the IAC, the International Academy of Ceramics, in 2019. Hitomi holds Bachelor and Master of Education in Arts degrees from Okayama University. She previously lived and worked as a ceramic artist in Shigaraki. In 2001, she received a Rotary International Scholarship that brought her to the United States, where she studied at the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. Hitomi is a ceramic artist and also manages their home studio named Studio Toya. She has been a member of the International Academy of Ceramics since 2017 and has participated in exhibitions around the globe. So, Shibata san,、uh, as we have discussed, the connections between Japan and the US have played an important role. In the recent rapid transformation of the Shigaraki tradition. Your background and experiences are part of this fascinating story. So, what inspired you as Japanese ceramic artists to move from Shigaraki to the US and specifically to North Carolina? And having lived in these different ceramic cultures, what does Shigaraki mean to you now? Please, Hitomi and Takuro. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having us today. <laughs> I'm Hitomi, and、uh, my husband, Takuro Shibata, we live in Seagrove, North Carolina, since 2005. <laughs> This is a picture when we were younger. We lived in Shigaraki for seven years, which was one of a few places in Japan where Young potters who are not from potter's family could learn how to make a living. We had lots of opportunities in Shigaraki to learn about the local ceramic materials, how to use them, and how to preserve them in a small community. The Shigaraki Ceramic Cultural Park frequently hosted. International ceramic artists, which inspired us to look for opportunities abroad. It was there that we met Mr. Otani and also Peter. After leaving Shigaraki, we moved to Massachusetts 
and I became a student at UMass Dartmouth ceramics program. After my program at UMass, we came to we came down to Virginia for our ceramics residency program, and we ended up in North Carolina, which is known for a long pottery traditions. We visited a potter in Seagrove, David Stempo and his partner, Nancy Gatobi, and uh, who came to Shigaraki Cer Ceramic Cultural Park when we lived in town. And uh, uh, this Shigaraki collection made us new friends in North Carolina. And uh, it opened the door to opportunity to come back to United States, North Carolina. And uh, Nancy, who is the executive director of Starworks, offered me a job to start Starworks Ceramics, to research North Carolina local clays and also studio programs. And uh, it was a big de uh, decision to make, but he told me and I talked and uh, decided to sell everything we had in Shigaraki and uh, took three suitcases and one cat and uh, moved to North Carolina in 2005. What does Shigaraki mean to us? To me, Shigaraki is a distinctive pottery village that blends old and new, tradition and innovation, and uh, toughness and kindness. It wasn't our permanent home, but was a place where we honed our skills and gained knowledge. Now there are many new businesses, share studios, and interesting events going on in Shigaraki. They are seeds for the new era and a hope for the future of our craft field. It's a powerful and a special place that attracts people from all over the world, including us. Yes, and uh, let me say quick about uh, my idea, what does Shigaraki mean to us? And uh, Shigaraki is really special place uh, to me uh, because I study ceramics there. And also I met Hitomi <laughs> and I married. So that was special place to me. Thank you so much for the great introduction. Wow. And uh, we uh, thank you so much for having us here. Wow, we're, we're delighted to have you to give us an insight into uh, the next generation of Shigaraki artists. Um, and uh, we've learned a lot and, and I commend your bravery. It was a big move to pick up and move to America. So welcome on board, even though you've been here for quite some time. Uh, I would like next to um, uh, introduce Peter Callis, who is a true American pioneer and is recognized as an authority on wood firing and the Anagama kiln. He is a two-time recipient of the prestigious Paula Krasner Fellowship, a Wingate uh, Foundation grant of supported the publication of his book, Peter Callis, An Enduring Legacy, and the award-winning documentary, Callus Life on Fire, which will be screened next year. It's very exciting at the Cannes Film Festival. At 23 years old, Peter traveled to Japan in search of a porcelain apprenticeship in Kyushu. In Seto, he stayed with Suzuki Goro, who showed him old wood fired kilns in the area and encouraged him to visit Shigaraki. Arriving at Arakusai Studio, Peter managed an invitation to help with the construction of a brand new Anagama kiln. He abandoned his porcelain aspirations and focused on visiting all of the six ancient kiln sites. Returning home to the US, Peter constructed his own Anagama kiln in 1975 and soon began a 23 year collaboration with the renowned artist, Peter Volkus. He now lives and works in his native New Jersey where he has built his current kiln. His work has been exhibited internationally and is in the collections of 35 major museums throughout the world. So Peter, welcome on board. 
And how did you first become attracted to shigaraki ware? And how did you know this was the medium for you as an artist? Did you have any reservations about stepping into such an ancient tradition as an outsider? And how do you place yourself within that long-standing tradition? Initially, when I went to Japan, to Japan to study porcelain, but the wabi-sabi aesthetic was hauntingly inspirational and compelling to me. So traveling around Japan for two months in 1974, as she stated, I did visit the six ancient kill sites, but was lucky enough to help build an anagama rock size studio, which basically changed my career trajectory. The aesthetic just felt like a good fit for my character. If you've not been to Japan and seen these wares firsthand, it is hard to grasp their strength and deep beauty. The rugged forms, patinas, and unique services are more than a curiosity and fascination. They are pots with a soul, and that was very important. I was living in the Northwest for several years, I became awestruck by the mountainous terrain, which dovetailed perfectly with Japan's love of nature. And it, it took a while in the U.S. to get the traction, because when you build a, the first kill, obviously, it's, uh, it's one of the hurdles you have. But, uh, and it took a while to get attention of the collectors and galleries. But, I, you know, as far as where I think I am, and I'm, uh, as far as my notes go, it was something to address. But I don't think of myself uh, as an outsider, really, as, as the wood fire community is a close knit one. And so it enjoys a communal activity and camaraderie. And I think Takro alluded to that as well. Obviously, some works of mine. And I think that at this point, it's fair to say that <clears throat> as far as where I place myself with this long-standing tradition, um, you know, I believe I stand shoulder to shoulder in this tradition. There's an old saying that says, practice and repetition make the master. So it goes to reason in the, most of the performing arts that the longer you do it, the better you get at your chosen profession. And really, at the end of the day, navigating galleries in the marketplace are part of the necessary evils. These right here, for those who are watching, represent 70s, 80s, and 2000 um, efforts. You know, if life teaches us, the test of time in, in art is really what matters um, in the art world. Like I say, history will pan all that out, but these are some pieces that I quite enjoy. I thought were pretty good examples of um, my efforts with sugar rock clay. And yeah, I, I, again, I just must emphasize that the composition of sugar rock clay, it's unique. It's, it's like Chinese jade or South African diamonds. It, it just doesn't exist everywhere. So I felt very fortunate to discover it and be able to use it. And these are some uh, hikidashi pieces. And, out of my kiln belvedere. I'd like to remark on the amazing Johan or kiln effects that you're able to create. Are any of these fired more than once or you're able to create all of this unctuous, gorgeous, thick, colorful kiln effect glazing with one firing? And now they're all one fired, once oh. fired. I think uh, to your point, kiln design is important and the length of fire. I fire for oh. eight days and mm -hmm. You know, when it gets down to it, at, at, when you unload the kill, there's maybe a wheelbarrow full of ash. And, and when you, you look at eight quarts of wood, um, yep. a lot of that goes on the wear. So if you've yep. got the right clay and it, it can, uh, the eutectics form, uh, you can build up these uh, heavy ash deposits if you stack your kill properly. And that's a right. big part of it because it's like in gardening, if you have flowers, trees, and shrubs, orchestrated and you orchestrate your kill stacking like a well-designed landscape you can get these effects yeah. well they're they're glorious and, well, and that, very sensual. You, I, I sincerely appreciate that i've well, always hoped you. to get your you to say something look yeah. at the work this is uh, it's very beautiful made very it all beautiful. worthwhile thank you so much my pleasure thank you for joining us peter uh shibata's uh clay is so important the the essential to shigaraki wear and the clay that comes from shigaraki which you experience firsthand when working in that region 
But now you live and work in North Carolina, which has its own unique clay, also pretty renowned, that is the foundation for your artistic practice. Can you tell us more about this fascinating resource around and even beneath you? And how does clay inform or shape your artistic process? So this is the view of our studio, but I mean the house and then the kilns. And uh, we moved to North Carolina in 2005 and then set up this uh, kilns and the studio. And then now we need to find clay, but I didn't know anything about the uh, uh, clay in the area. So uh, I uh, talked to local potters or a soil scientist um, or a local clay engineer, uh, especially Stephen Brankenbaker, who works for a local brick company and asked his uh, advice. But uh, yeah, it's hard to do it, but uh, we are just uh, grabbing empty buckets and the shovels to look for wild clay. And uh, I just went through uh, simple clay tests and uh, dried up uh, wild clay and then crushed them with the hammer and uh, fire to see. And uh, so this is the uh, photo uh, how uh, I tested. We don't have any fancy equipment, just a uh, uh, scale and uh, caliper and check the shrinkage and water absorption. We could found uh, many beautiful colors of grays. So these are the colors of the uh, raw clay uh, in North Carolina. So there are many different colors and most of them works uh, good for making pottery. And uh, during the pandemic, he told me and I wrote a book about uh, our journey, experience and the philosophy about wild clay and uh, with the co-author co Matt Libby. The book came out in October, 2022. And uh, after a few years of research of North Carolina clay and uh, clay resources, I was able to set up Starworks Ceramics Clay Factory in 2008. And uh, this is kind of idea, the same idea that Shigaraki Clay Company do. So get the uh, clay from the ground and then uh, crush it and then mix with the water to make a clay strip and then send it to the filter press to remove the water out and then make a clay cakes and then blend those clay cakes to make a clay body. But anyway, so that's uh, 2008 and then start producing uh, North Carolina wild clay bodies in 2009. And it has got a good reputation from potters and artists and the Starbucks clay business has been growing. And uh, we made a short movie about uh, processing uh, our pottery. So please take a look. So this is our uh, this is a drone video from Sky, so you could see our kilns and the studio. And uh, we recently excavated uh, part of our property and uh, found uh, this beautiful red clay. And uh, we use uh, red clay um, to make our work. And also we use uh, white uh, kaolin clay, local kaolin clay to uh, coat and then uh, use iron oxide to decorate it. And then we load this into the, our wood kiln and uh, fire it. So this is three weeks ago, uh, we fired this uh, salt chamber. It's behind of Anagama and it takes about 24 hours uh, to fire and uh, three days to cool. And we have been firing this chamber about 45 times. And uh, the temperature is around 2300 Fahrenheit. And uh, we take the peep hole out and check the pyrometric cone uh, to determine when the time to stop firing. And after the firing, we wait three, four days and then take the door out. And then this is Hitomi's sculpture. And then uh, this is my sculpture, I mean jar. 
So that's our process. So we have learned so much about North Carolina clay from our experiences. And uh, we found uh, some clays which uh, have a uh, lots of iron uh, in it. And uh, we use the uh, high iron clay body. And also we use white kaolin clay uh, to coat it. So that's uh, like a kohiki ware. When we were in Japan, uh, I did an apprenticeship with the, one of the pottery uh, named Tanikan Pottery, and they were making kohiki ware. So shigaraki is uh, like uh, Louis San said, uh, not only yakishime, but now many people doing uh, different uh, grazes or kohiki ware uh, when I was there 18, 18 years ago. And uh, also, we found one of the uh, beautiful kaolin clay uh, could flush really well in uh, the wood kiln. So some of the shigaraki clay could create beautiful flushing effect uh, called hero. So I liked the hero uh, effect uh, when I was in Japan, shigaraki. So I kind of making a uh, idea using uh, with the North Carolina materials to make my work. And then this is uh, influence from Shigaraki jar, but it's maybe too tiny for the neck and the uh, top. But anyway, so that's the idea I use to make my work. And then now I'm uh, working on open form, like a uh, fire frame uh, forms. Um, that's uh, what I make recently. We are not trying to make same work that uh, we were making in Shigaraki. Uh, ceramics materials are different and also the culture here is very different from Japan. So these uh, differences give us new perspectives and also inspirations to create our current work. And uh, so that's our work, my work. And then next one is Hitomi's. So um, we just simply use our hands, a couple of tools, natural materials, and the wood firing methods in order to preserve the beautiful characters of nature. Wood firing is also a very important process to complete our ceramic works. And it gives a sense of sustainability, which we learned from Shigaraki pottery traditions and also from American ceramics culture. It's a lifelong experiment and the fusion of ceramic art between Japanese and American cultures that we lived and loved. The last one I want to answer is uh, the key differences you notice between Shigaraki clay and North Carolina wild clay. So that's the really tough question to answer. And uh, Pete Sun was telling um, a little bit about uh, Shigaraki clay is like a mountain clay. And uh, it's the all the clay is wonderful. I mean, no, no clay is uh, bad. And uh, it is deeply tied into the geology. So all clays are so unique. But Shigaraki clay, it's uh, special because I think uh, um, the people who are in Shigaraki uh, try and error and they find the best way to use it. So there's a materials, but they really know how to use it. So that's the beauty of the Shigaraki clay comes from. And then North Carolina, uh, we have many beautiful clays, but it's kind of a little bit similar that uh, people around here uh, get the clay from the ground and uh, test it. And then they find out it uh, has a high in silica so then that's uh, suitable for salt firing. And around the Seagrove area, they have been using Seagrove clay and the fire in wood salt firing. 
and then that gives beautiful uh, gray, salt grays on the piece. So I think it's always um, the material is one thing. Materials are one thing, but uh, people, community, uh, figured out the way to use it. So that's the uh, uh, wonderful part as a uh, part of the Potter's community in North Carolina now, but also when we were in Shigaraki, we felt that way too. But thank you so much for listening. Thank you both of you for your personal insights as you span Shigaraki to America in a very different way from Peter's experience. And um, I have to agree in my 40 plus years in the field um, that the people who love clay and make their living from clay are very special people, no matter where they are, very different from artists and other media. And I think it's that passion for the material itself and for the aspects of nature that join you together that makes it a, a true village in many senses. So thank you for those comments. They're very um, relevant to me too. Um, I wanna pick back up with Peter um, about your wood firing process. But why do you keep working in wood fire and and you have a following for that are you inspiring others to do so first important thing is that the anagama really was a cornerstone of the golden age of ceramics notably the kiln is unique for a semi-subterranean hillside construction a medieval period japanese adaptation of the horizontally orientated Chinese and Korean wood-fired kiln, the hillside angle, which induces a strong draft is necessary to create high temperatures. And additionally, the shape permits for terracing of pots, for better distribution of heat and ash. And in my opinion, the work produced from them are incomparable and timeless. So the potters often build uh, slopes where it is necessary to replicate hillsides on the left, is a 250 year old chamber kiln that Goro took me to in Seto. And on the right is a kiln, chamber kiln built in a valley, which needed an artificial slope. These are some images that show the fired variations, which add to the distinct warmth variation. And really what's, what's attracted me to wood fire some 50 years ago. The three main components, that contribute to the sugar rocky ware. Obviously, the clay, the wood, and the kill. In sugar rocky, the wood burning kills are either the nabori gama or chamber kill or anagama, which is a single chamber tunnel kill, which typically are on 14 degree slopes that affect the draft, cooling, and fire color. Temperatures can be all over the place, and it's very personal choice. Thinking it through, I came to realize that the kilns were all basic variations of the hillside design, and they all used red pine to fire the kills. What made them different was the specific clays from each village. Bizen uses rice paddy clay, while Shigaraki uses the strong mountain clay. So it's the local clays that really give all the distinct qualities. So this is an image from 1974 at rock size at the kiln site with the builders. And interesting enough, these builders, it's the last kiln they built, so I felt very fortunate. We're standing in front of an old chamber kiln documented in Dan Rhodes's kiln book. The center, we're excavating for the Anagama, and on the right is a detail of the finished arch. The whole kiln project took about a week. So this is a picture of Kozo Takahashi, who is the current Rokusai. On the right is a Gyokeji temple where I slept for several days walking back and forth early morning to the kiln site until the Rokusai family invited me to stay with them, which is quite an honor. So this slide is uh, Isezaki June, the current living national treasure, it's called the Jagama kiln, from what I understand, which is basically a split bamboo anagama design. 
Okay, this is a picture of me with Isezaki and his assistant, again in 1974, and his chamber kill. So while in Shigaraki in 1975, I met Michio Furutani, one of Shigaraki's premier artists. Here's Volkus and I sitting uh, or visiting him during a firing. For me, his work was astonishing and believe had he not passed so young, he could have been the first living national treasure from Shigaraki. I recommend reading his book on Anagama kilns to better understand them. It documents the dozens of kilns he built. Some were solely for flashing while others were designed for heavily ash glazed ware. Furutani intimately understood the importance of great clay, about a hundred tons from one location ensures his family quality control for generations. So the last component is the fuel. Shigaraki's Anagamas all fire using red pine as do all wood burning kilns in Japan. It's a matter of eutectics and alchemy to determine the final appearance. There's some personal challenges I faced as a young potter when I began this construction of the first US Anagama back in 1975. And they were mostly due to inexperience. Once I started, there was no one to ask for advice and no internet. All I knew was from the one week assisting Rockside a year earlier. With little money and working almost entirely by myself, it meant salvaging 4,000 brick, hand digging the foundation in Rockland County and doing all the brick work twice. It was a poor location with multiple drainage issues causing the first effort to collapse from flooding. And rebuilding it ironically in the middle slide, I had unearthed the water main from the property inches in front of the firebox. You can see the pipe. That winter it froze. The pipe snapped and flooded the kiln again, resulting in a frozen lake. Building the kills are a challenge, but studying kill building principles like proper buttressing make for a durable kill. And I should say the slide on the right, you can see that uh, the kiln's uh, finally uh, near completion with the additional drainage. Um, and to that point, I know a potter who had the opportunity to visit and ask for advice when he built his kill. He didn't, he did not. And three years later, his kill collapsed. So it harkens back to the old adage that you need to listen to the voice of experience or pay for your own mistakes. So the next slide, there you go. So once completed over the next decade, I had to teach myself how to fire by eye. I had never fired a wood kill and try to maintain the kill and equipment. The enormous amount of wood used to fire was also problematic. Here's a couple of images of the wood uh, it's required in the kiln side. And at the time, it was me and an ax. I could get wood delivered, but the wood was never sized for kiln use. It was fireplace wood. Unlike Shigaraki, where wood companies deliver hundreds of kiln ready bundles to the potter for each fire. So these images show the volume and split kiln ready wood stacked ready for a fire. Uh, these are some images of my property and obviously uh, the wabi-sabi aesthetic kicked in, but uh, this is a decade later when I relocated to Belvedere, New Jersey and bought an 1812 Moravian farmhouse with a barn and a studio and a hillside. The property had been, was been an inspirational place to live and work. And over the years, I became with land, obsessed with landscaping and gardening, and which I really believed uh, love for nature and pots and everything it worked well this is a cross section of my kill and um with the construction i built an oversized shed to hold the wood and tons of clay mostly most most of the clay i imported from Shigaraki in 1996 uh, once i discovered how superior their clay was my kill in belvedere was completed in 1987 and it's been fired over a hundred times. It could last another 50 years with little maintenance. There's challenges with building and maintaining them in the US and every wood kill has logistical hur hurdles, including zoning permits, sources for wood, hillside, and of course, a market. 
One potter I know ignored applying for permits. When the neighbors saw smoke, they reacted and forced them to dismantle the kill. So zoning approval was critical for me to build my Belvedere kill and with all the ducks in a row, township, city, state, only the federal government could shut me down and I'm quite confident they're too busy fighting amongst themselves right now to come after me. Thank you, Peter. It, that was uh, amazing. Uh, one quick question as we look at this slide before it changes, if you will build it, he will come. Who's he? It just it just was a line out of a, a, a movie, uh, Field of Dreams. No, it's they will come. I know. Oh, but okay. So I'm wondering why you changed the pronoun. Because to I was host I was hosting workshops. Okay. So, got it. Got it. Right. Thank you. So my final question to Louise and Otani Sensei. Uh, working within such a venerable ceramic tradition, people may assume that you may be bound by some kinds of uh, limitations in the medium, but you have found tremendous creativity within, quote unquote, the requirements of Shigaraki Yaki. So how do you approach the evolution within your own oeuvre? And after decades of working in the, this medium, how do you continue to find something new or different, or dare I say, even surprising in Shigaraki wear, Sensei? Yes. Yes.、えっと、私はね、あの子供の時からあの本当に新しいものとかあの珍しいものとかそういうものに非常に興味があって、ま。どんなものあの楽しみなんですけれども、まあ、あの本本を読むときでも、まあ、いろんな偉人の偉人展とかあるいは冒険家の本とか、そういうものを、うん、ワクワクしながら、え、読んで、その、そういうものからいろんな刺
to avoid bringing those traditions into my own work. I had to discover who it was, even while bearing the heavy burden of tradition that was so much a part of me and the place where I live and work. まあ、アメリカへ行っていろんな人と会いまして、えー、たくさんの作品を見たりいろんなアートを見たんですけどその時の交流とかその時のことがその私の今の作品に大きな影響を与えていました。My opportunities to travel to the United States to learn about American ceramics and to interact with many artists and their work have had a deeply meaningful effect On how my own work has developed. Mm-hmm. I have carried out my search for something new through my approach to wood firing. I have struggled to fire the wood fired kiln that is so temperamental, and I have constantly tried to avoid repeating myself. Instead, I experiment with different ways to stack my work in the kiln and vary the length of the firing and the temperature, all to work towards something new that I have not seen or done before. So, you have to do a lot of work, 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 ヒーローとか妖艶とかそういうものもそういうのから出てきました。Even in the failures that result from the process and the experimentation, I can discover little hints about how to incorporate my own individuality into my work. My distinctive approaches to the bright colors of oxidation firing, so called flame color, and the moodiness of the kiln change. Reduction firing have emerged from this process. またあの本来シガラキは無用なんですけれども、やあの誘惑をかけたり、まあ表面にデコボコとかそういう凹凸をつけたりして、えそれをまあ二度三度と焼いたりして、でまたあの逆さまにして焼いたり横にして焼いたりそういう実験もしてます。そのから生まれてくる作品が非常に面白かったです。I try new approach, approaches that include applying glaze. And of course, you know that Shigaraki、uh, traditionally is not glazed at all. But I apply glaze, I alter the surface with relief texture or linear motifs, or I fire the same piece two or three times. Sometimes I lay a work on its side in the kiln, or I fire it upside down to accumulate glaze and coloration in new ways. まあ、昔の備前焼きからヘントを得てお皿を繰り返して焼いたり逆さまにして焼いたりそういうことからその木の流れ木の流れの面白さを取り入れたそれをそ,れをその後を木の流れの後を作品にあの利用しています。Taking a hint from the Zenware firing procedures of the past, I tried firing platters upside down, and that produced a beautiful flame color or a decoration in the form of traces of the movement of the fire over the clay. まあ大きな貝をあの作品の下に焼くんですけれども、まあうん、その焼き方というのはまあ私が一番最初に発見して、いよもういろんな。ところでそういう焼き方を見るんですけれども、まあ、まあの、なんとか自慢じゃないですけれども、世界で一番先にやり,やり出したのは私だと思っています。I've also created shell patterns on the surfaces of my pieces by placing large shells underneath the pieces and 
expecting that they will vaporize in the firing and leave their texture. I believe I was the first person in the world to <coughs> discover and utilize this technique. いつもね、いろんなことを成功したわけではないんですけれども、えー、やっぱりあ、その中から、失敗の中から新しいものを発見して、いつもその次のステップに、えー、して、あの日頃を発見することになります。I certainly don't feel that I have succeeded every time, but there are always new discoveries that lead me for the next step in my work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both.、Uh, the range of your work,、uh, Sensei, is truly extraordinary. And、uh, some of your work, I do feel like I am in Bizen looking at Isazaki Koichiro's work、uh, and the similarities in effect that you're able to create with a totally different firing time and different materials is extraordinary. And,、uh, Truly, I have to come back and visit you next time I'm in,、uh, in Japan. I've let too much time evaporate. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. It's a treat.、Uh, my last question goes to、uh, Oyobi Sensei from Michigan. And I would like to, as truly the, <laughs> the, the inspiration for this whole event tonight,、um, through the story of Clea's soft power. Um, you have focused on the decades immediately following World War II, and your exhibition continues that story with works through to the present day. So, for you, after studying and curating the entire range of Shigaraki ware in Japan and in the United States, you're the perfect person to ask where do you see Shigaraki ware or Shigaraki clay art going in the future? Um, thank you.、Um, so, considering today's、um, Shigaraki Bear on a global scale, I think there are two、uh, very important driving forces. One is the residency program at the Shigaraki Ceramic Culture Park, SCCP,、uh, which Shibata san already mentioned. It's、um, Togen Mori in Japanese. So, from its establishment in the early 1990s, the SCCP has a very active international residency program. And here, established artists、uh, like Peter Bokos and Peter Kallas、uh, worked use, using local materials and wood fired kilns. The program also had nationally recognized artists like Wada Morihiro, or more recently,、uh, Kuata Takuro, and provided a locus for experimentation and creative collaborations with younger resident artists and Shigaraki artists. This is the SCP studio space、uh, re more recently、uh, showing young artists from UK, Hamish Jackson. Another driving force is the presence of private collectors in the United States. In the post war history of Shigaraki ware collecting,、uh, I just talked about earlier, types of Shigaraki ware collected by American museums were mainly large storage jars. These were often displayed with large screen paintings. In the exhibition, we recreated、uh, this pairing. Contemporary American collectors are similarly drawn to larger works, and that brings a fascinating shift in the making of Shigaraki ware. One of the lenders to the exhibition, Robert and Lisa Kessler in Colorado, purchased this exceptionally large jar by Shigaraki artist Kobayashi Yucho. Kobayashi said he never imagined selling this large jar sitting outside of his studio for a long time. This is a large space by Ota Nishiro.、Uh, it's actually a、uh, very recognized space at Ota n i s e n s e i s gallery. Um, but um, so uh, this was recently purchased by Joe and Nancy Keefley for our museum and featured in the clay as soft power, as clay as soft power exhibition. Ota n i s e n s e i s large pieces like this are in other private collections as well. As Shigaraki wears traditional markets of tea ceremony and flower arrangements have been shrinking, many Shigaraki wear artists are eager to engage in the tastes of collectors outside of Japan. While being experimental, they are exploring what is the character of Shigaraki wear and how it can be distinctive from other Yakishime traditions like Bizen. Also, an exciting development, which was partly initiated by the presence of American women ceramic artists in the 1960s, is the increasing number of women artists in Shigaraki. 
a pioneering woman potter in Shigaraki, Koyama Kiyoko, remembers her sense of, sense of revelation when she saw American ceramic artists like Suzanne Stevenson and George Zerbs walking side by side with male potters at the studio of Takashi Rakusai III. Stevenson and Zerbs were also taking part in firing, a task forbidden to Shigaraki women at that time. Koyama, who was making a living by painting decorations on ceramics, soon began creating her own works and submitting them to juried exhibitions. By 1970, she had built a kiln in her studio so that she could experiment with natural ash clays without needing to borrow space in other potter's kilns. Koyama Kyoko's success laid the ground for the next generation of women artists. Takashi Yoshiko was born into the family of Takashi Rakusai, a lineage of Shigaraki ware makers that began in the 19th century. Her great-grandfather, Rakusai III, taught these American artists I just mentioned, and also Peter, uh, when she becomes uh, the head of the family studio, Yoshiko will be the first woman, uh, first woman artist to succeed to the Rakusai's name. There are other women artists working in Yakishime Shigaraki wear, such as uh, Iyama Sonoko and Nakajima Aya. In summary, it is my observation that there will be a more experimental and larger works and more attractive works for, collection, uh, for collectors in the United States, and definitely more works by women artists working in Shigaraki wear. Thank you. I couldn't agree with you more, Natsan. That was... <laughs> um, the women these days in Japan are the, who are filling the positions at universities, but now they're succeeding to positions in family-led uh, traditions and ancient traditions as well as a very exciting development. And I would agree with you also that the interest on the part of uh, collectors and institutional buyers such as yourself uh, across the globe is going to change the face of Shigaraki wear as well as other types of wear in the future. Uh, as we are running long on time and we have uh, 20 plus questions, um, we will be here till uh, the wee hours if we go through them. What I would suggest is that I will, my team will um, take these questions, present them to the artists and they can answer them in writing and then we will circulate them to the attendees and post them along with the video, which will be available later this week. So you can listen again to all these insightful co comments by our amazing, amazing panels. And the responses, in addition to the questions, there have been um, very, very um, supportive and um, enthusiastic uh, response by our viewers tonight. Uh, these are the, the four books that we were discussing uh, and mentioning uh, when each of our participants were introduced. And you can see on the screen how you can try and uh, obtain them. Certainly, Amazon.com will be um, invaluable, particularly for Louise's book that was republished in 2020. And I assume the University of Michigan has plenty of copies of Clay is Soft Power avail available to you through their website. This is what is going forward with our participants that you can pay attention to on the web or um, communicate with them directly. Um, if you're interested in approaching Otani Sensei, please let me know. I will try and put you in contact. And of course, Peter, I can't believe it. You're off to Bali. We all want to go. It sounds amazing. And um, the Shibatas are, I assume, welcome uh, any interest on the part of any of our um, listeners tonight. Uh, for our gallery in particular, our next show coming up, uh, you saw a piece of Shigaraki where by Wada Morihiro when he was uh, a resident in Shigaraki for a short time. And we're doing a show focused on the opposite of what we're talking tonight, which is a uh, painted surface decoration and how artists approach that in terms of unification of form and surface. And we have published a catalog which literally came from the printer two days ago. Uh, and if you're interested in obtaining a copy, please let us know. And during Asia Week, we will have two exhibitions in our gallery. One, the painted clay exhibition, and another, a collaboration with the leading dealer in Japan, Shibunkaku, um, dealing with uh, painted surfaces on canvas and other materials that will decorate our walls of our gallery. So if you are in New York, 
uh, from mid-March to early April, please stop by. So I wish to thank our participants. Uh, it's been an amazing um, revelatory experience, I think, for everyone who's lucky enough to be listening tonight. Thank you for your thoughts, your beautiful slides, your imagery, and your insights. Um, and I'm sure the potters in the audience, of which there is quite a number, will be equally inspired by what you had to say tonight. So thank you very much and good night to all of you. And thank you for hanging in for um, well over an hour and a half. Thank you very much. We talked about, the uh, question was about gas and electric kills. And obviously they're more convenient, more affordable. They fire evenly. They're easy to manage far less labor intensive and are particularly useful for production pottery. With all the diversity in, in ceramics, many styles really don't need wood fire. Narrative and decorative brushwork do just fine in gas and electric fires. I think it is the allure of fire that attract artists to the anagama. It's a strange attraction, but as they say, fire is sexy. And so it has a way in a way, it's a timeless attraction. Today, there's a growing fascination in the US with hundreds of wood kills in operation. Designs have changed with many building flat train kills. They're very popular in universities for their ease of operations. They function well enough and are easier to operate, but the results are discernibly different. 